night or go under. And the Americans had wounded French pride. They were determined to fight back on their own terms. Boeing turned the screw even further with the launch of the 747. After some initial teething problems, it made its maiden voyage on the 9th of February 1969. Boeing had built probably the most formidable flying machine of the second half of the 20th century. The 747 carried twice as many passengers than possible before, and over a thousand were sold all over the world. The Europeans decided on a different direction. They didn't believe in the future of mass transport. They thought that the better market was luxury transport for businessmen in a hurry. They thought Jet Set, they thought Concorde, and they were wrong. Concorde was the most fantastic and most expensive Anglo-French aeronautical project of the 20th century, and it proved to be a fiasco financially, but it became one of the last truly mythical planes. After the failure of the Caravelle and Concorde, the Europeans finally realised that they had to join forces to beat the Americans. In France, Aerospatial boss Henry Ziegler, who had masterminded the Concorde project, was a firm believer in European cooperation. In Germany, Franz Josef Strauss was also convinced. The English were a little more reticent. Finally, in 1969, agreement was reached to build a 300-seater long-haul plane. Baptised the A300, final assembly would be at Toulouse in France. When the first Airbus finally came off the assembly line in 1972, Concorde was still the star. At the time, Concorde was at the height of its glory. The trials were going well, and airlines were promising to buy it. On the hangar doors had been hung all the names of the companies who had ordered, or at least had signed a piece of paper to say that they would And the Airbus was not yet a success. A grand, a grand presentation was organised, what is known as a rollout. The Airbus came out of its hangar for its first flight, the Concorde was part of it. Everyone was there, from the President of the Republic, the Republic to journalists from all over the world. Journalist. It was a great ceremony. ceremony. I was piloting the Airbus, Ma but I remember being really disappointed. Everyone was flocking around Concorde, no one was taking an interest in the Airbus. I climbed out of the Airbus, and at the foot of the ladder, one of the Aerospatial bosses, a friend who had the same name as me, said, Listen, Bernard, there, looking at Concorde, I can see the future. But what are we going to do with your big cow? But là, with your grosse vache, what are we going to do? Roger Bétaille and Henry Ziegler fought hard to save the Airbus, and finally, the 28th of October 1972, the A300 took to the sky. The 
Lorsque l'industrie française et européenne When the Europeans proposed the A300, Air France were naturally interested, saying they would buy it when the plane was competitive. À partir du moment où c'était un avion compétitif. But the problem was that the Airbus was a medium-haul plane. Et un avion moyen courrier. So Air France bought the long-haul Boeing 747. Long courrier. Four years later, the situation was catastrophic. Only one plane built by the Toulouse factory had been sold. Everyone was predicting the end of Airbus, and the Americans and Boeing did all they could to block its commercialization using all possible means. They blocked access to the American market, which at the time represented 40% of the world aviation fleet. The powerful American lobbies used every trick in the book. In the late 1970s, no holes were barred. First, the plane was forbidden to land at New York. The reason? The plane was too heavy for the runways built on piles. The DC-10 was, however, much heavier. I'm a crawling the heat. When I listen to the beat, chime in the dream. I can feel the resistance here, running through my veins, straight to my head. Not long afterwards, there was the strange affair of the air hostesses who suffered from eczema. The culprit turned out to be the paint used on the safety jackets, which were American made. Then, all the Airbus were grounded following an accident of a McDonnell Douglas. Why Airbus? Because they used the same engines. Would the Americans succeed in suffocating Airbus as they had with the Caravelle and Concorde? Maybe not this time. Airbus had understood that to survive, they had to pierce the American market. And they believed that they could. And we made it. In retrospect, everyone would agree that when we started, we were very naïf. We were convinced we would succeed. We had faith in our very beautiful aeroplane. We were convinced that everyone was going to buy it. The director of Airbus sales in the United States, George Ward, worked unceasingly to try and convince the American Airlines. He met Eastern Airlines boss Frank Boerman, a former Apollo astronaut and something of an all-American hero. Boerman wanted to renew part of his fleet. Obviously, he approached Boeing and Douglas, but he also contacted the little European constructor that everyone was talking about. G-A-S-U to the Z-A Gasuza is the name I'm gonna change the rap game Have you asked me who did it Cause the boy can really kick it Live life on the edge Airbus made him an incredible offer They would lend four Airbus to Eastern for six months So that they could test them under actual working conditions It's just more raw Plus that's Canada legend Turn my back In a b-boy stance I proceed to match Boeing found this very amusing From New York to Paris we live this way We're cutting edge setting trends trailblazing With no ceiling what a feeling it's amazing Never afraid to stand on the ledge This is the life when you're living on the edge Airbus took a huge risk Nothing was signed there was no firm contract. They would operate the four planes and it had to work. And it did, and it worked. The test was conclusive. Bormann was the first American company to order the Airbus. Only the popularity of the former astronaut prevented him from being lynched by the American media.
I delivered the first plane to Easton. It was very funny because the American press had all been talking about Borman's new bird. And flying over America, I heard radio messages from the air traffic controllers and the other planes. American airspace is pretty busy. And everyone was saying, have you seen that plane? Back came the reply, it's the new European plane. You know Borman's plane. And a dick Texan voice said, but it looks like a real aeroplane. In 1978, the Europeans adopted the Boeing concept of a family of planes using the same basic fuselage. They built the A310, a bigger version of the A300. And as the orders started to flood in, the Americans attacked, saying that the plane was being financed by member countries against the rules of free trade. The controversy lasted for years, the Europeans retorting that the 747 had been financed by the American Air Force. One of the big differences between the Boeings and the Airbus was in the cockpit. And pilots had their own preferences. Well, I flew the 707 and the 747. The Boeing philosophy was to make everything as simple and as robust as possible. You could leave everything switched on. You press the start button and it works. And it still works. It made your life very simple. The Europeans were always more sophisticated. Just look at their sports cars. Now, sophistication has its advantages, but its disadvantages. The Airbus A320, with its electric controls, was a complete revolution. There was no longer the traditional joystick. There was just a little control column. Even though Boeing today used electric controls, they kept the joystick, so the pilots won't be too disoriented. The new A320 was smaller, but still part of the Airbus family. It was baptised in great pomp by President Chirac and Prince Charles, who praised the new concept of electrical controls and its new control column. The development as Airbus developed its family of planes, with the A320, the A319 and the A318, then the long-haul A330 and A340, the Air France fleet, along with Air Inter, went from just a few dozen Airbus planes to today's situation where, with the long and mid-haul planes, they have something like um, 200 Airbus planes. Uh, 200 Airbus and about 70 or 80 Boeings. Boeing reacted by modernising its venerable 737, of which 3,600 had already been built. In other words, more than the total of all the planes built by Airbus since its creation. There's a great rivalry between constructors, as there is in the car industry, and this competition helps to encourage technological advance. If one constructor has a monopoly, he tends to rest on his laurels. Competition obliges you to develop your technology. Neither Boeing or Douglas took it seriously at first. They then started to realise that we were a threat, and from then on, it was total warfare with no holds barred. Fortunately, Boeing made a huge mistake. Faced with the